I'm nervous for this. I want to be honest with you guys, I've actually had nightmares about the situation. <laughs> me being in front of 100 people, expecting me to do something I have very little training for, but in these, underwear, in, in these nightmares, I'm in my underwear. <laughs> and people are yelling at me, and dollar bills are being exchanged at an alarming rate. <laughs> oh wait, I've done that before. I don't know McCain Auditorium during drag shows. And let me tell you, I do enjoy drag shows at McCain because it gives me a whole wealth of people to talk to from very different backgrounds. And the great thing about drag shows is people know the difference between a gay man who is wearing a wig and putting on a show and a transgender woman who identifies as a woman but was born with a penis. And this is a fascinating thing because when I am in my skivvies on McCain Auditorium in front of a thousand people where I'm surprisingly not as nervous as I am in this moment, I have been called many things, brash, ambitious, out there, but no one has ever called me a woman when I'm in my skivvies in front of McCain. And let me tell you, I've done some feminine things in my life. I have gone to the spa with my mom. I have both enjoyed the movie and book Pride and Prejudice, and I can rock amazing heels that are about this big and have given me a new appreciation for all the women in my life. But after all these things, no one has ever misidentified my gender. I identify as a man and society agrees with me. Uh, because of my biological sex, what's in between my legs, and my gender identity, what's in my mind, a line, I am granted that privilege. People like me are called cisgender. But there are some other people in the world, most notably transgender people who biological sex and gender identity do not align. There's also agender people, polygender people, gender fluid people, so many gender identities that I honestly don't know or can name half of them. But that's why I'm here today. I'm here to open everyone's horizons in gender non-conforming individuals. This helpfully encompasses my two passions in life. Number one, social psychology, and number two, advancing human rights. So, what is social psychology, you might ask? Social psychology is the study of how people interact with groups. We study the ABCs, affect, behavior, and cognition. We study why you don't like that professor who has the worst lectures. We study how beliefs in pure good and pure evil affect how everyone goes about their daily life. And we study prejudice towards gays, towards blacks, towards women, towards gender nonconforming individuals, just to name a few. But that line of research gets me into my second great love, advancing human rights. Here I am at last year's Little Apple Pride Parade underneath the American flag. It was a wonderful time and I am looking forward to the parade this year. But I wanna see a just world. My version of a just world is where everyone is treated equally, no matter what. I know that's probably not gonna happen at least within my lifetime. So ideally I wanna see a world where people are not judged based on their group identity if they identify as gay, they can identify as gay without any negative repercussions. But let me reframe and refocus a little bit from me to the actual research discussing transgender individuals and gender nonconforming individuals. So there are two sides of this research. There are the perceiver side and the target side. Perceivers are the ones doing or not doing actions to the targets. Targets in this instance are gender non-conforming individuals who are receiving or not receiving the perceptions of people. I have been focusing on the perceiver side for the past two years and I wanna spend the next 20, 40, 60 years of my career looking at this side of research because everyone has perceptions, whether they're positive, negative, indifferent, or you just don't know. They're all perceptions of these individuals. So what have we learned in the past 40 years of research on gender non-conforming individuals and how people perceive them. Well, it might be hindsight bias at work, but we haven't really learned stuff that's not common sense. We learned that people who are more blatantly transphobic, a la going into an alley and beating up a person who identifies as transgender, are a little more transphobic than those who are not willing to do that. We also learned that people have similar attitudes towards lesbians and gays as they do to transgender men and transgender women. But I have to emphasize that people are more, have more favorable views towards gays and lesbians than they do towards transgender men and women. And we learned that people really don't know much about gender nonconforming individuals. And previous research has 
shown that people really don't like what they don't know. So if any of you have taken a philosophy or logic class here at K-State, probably helped me with the following inference that people don't like gender nonconforming individuals because they don't know too much about them. But zooming back out and reframing and refocusing yet again, you might remember that I said that th that's only half the battle. The other side is targets. Targets are those who are receiving or not receiving the prejudice. And the reframing and refocusing of this research hasn't drastically changed in the past 20, 30 years. But I do wanted to point out that one of the major um, breakthroughs in this is getting the public more aware of the difference between transgender individuals and transvestites. Transgender individuals who are those who are identified as the opposite gender than what they were assigned at birth and wear the clothing of that opposite gender to, or the opposite, the identified gender to alleviate dysphoria, whereas transvestites are those who um, wear the clothing of the opposite gender as a fetish or to express themselves sexually. But I want to again reframe and refocus from the background research on transgender individuals and gender nonconforming to a case study for a little bit of a humanizing perspective. A case study that involves my good friend Alex. Alex identifies as agender, which means that Alex is not a man nor a woman, they just identify as a they. Um, and as much as I want to tell Alex one day, just sit them down and say, it's very hard for me to constantly remember and validate your gender identity, always calling you them and they as opposed to he and him, I just can't do that. Just look at that face. I care about Alex, and Alex is a very human person to me. So I don't want to cause them discomfort by calling them by their wrong pronouns. So I recently sat down with Alex at a coffee shop and interviewed them, asking how is life more difficult for gender nonconforming individuals like them as opposed to cisgender people like myself. Well, they told me that they have to live in this very binary world, that they're either a man or a woman. There's no third option. There's no I don't want these options. There's no nothing. But they also talked about how Agent people are different than transgender people. Um, they're trying to fight the perception that agender is just trans light, like diet trans. Um, they say that transgender people tend to have more media representation than agender, polygender, gender fluid people because transgender people fit into the gender binary in an abnormal way. Whereas agender people are just like, we do not need that. Thank you very much. Um, so I I ended our conversation by asking if given the opportunity to, through me, say something to TEDxMHK, what would you say? And they said that being agender isn't their life. It's just one of many facets of it. It's on the same level as being white, an engineer, or a lover of Indian food. Agender does not define Alex. And then they ended our conversation by saying five words that really spoke with me and like if threads wasn't still on like smoke damage, I'd probably put this on a t-shirt, but just let us be us, which I think is a very nice sentiment for this talk. Increasing empathy among people and just letting those who want to be who they are, let them be who they are. And why, who are we to get in that way? But again, to reframe and refocus this back to me, unfortunately. But I, unfortunately, want to change the world. This is an unfortunate place to be because I know I probably can't, not at least in any substantial way. But we have a phrase for this in, cognitive dis in psychology called cognitive dissonance, where on one side of my mind, I'm thinking, wow, look at all this amazing research and what we can do just talking about how life could be better for gender nonconforming individuals. But then on the other side of my mind, I'm thinking, look at all the people in the world just so resistant to change. Your talk is but a drop in the bucket, a bucket full of the status quo. But then somewhere in the middle, there's like this other part of me that just wants to bang their heads together and say, that kind of pessimism has no place at TEDx MHK. So I'm going to step back and ask you guys a question. I know you guys all have little notepads and golf pencils. I'm going to ask you whether it applies to my talk or to any other talk today's. I'm going to ask you a question that I ask all my residents when I sit them down at Kramer Dying Hall after a long day of studying. I'm going to ask you the question I ask myself after every lecture I survive. 
I'm going to ask you the question that I ask my roommate after every test he takes. I want to ask you, what did you learn today? And I would love if you just wrote that down on your paste paper, because I feel like this is a good question to inspire everyone to live their fullest. And I try to ask myself it every day, because today I learned that people's perceptions of transgender individuals are pretty similar to lesbians and gays, but they are different and not very better. That was not good English, and I apologize. I also learned that I can sprint in three-inch red heels, and it's kind of a freaky sight if you've ever seen it. I, I, I pity you if you have. Um, but we also learned that my friend Alex says, just let us be us, which I think is a good takeaway from this, not to influence your own what you learned today, but that's mine. My friend Alex says, just let us be us. But the key to understanding gender nonconformers is empathy. And empathy is a hard task. Doing the right thing is hard. Being a good person is hard. And I don't expect every single person in this world to have that same gumption to go and make life better for these individuals. But I want you to stop and ask, maybe why? Because life is hard for gender nonconforming individuals. And sometimes it's hard to empathize with them. Some of you might be like me and wonder what the difference between gender fluid, agender, polygender is. But again, I invite you not to hate based off this ignorance. And if you can, just walk a mile in someone else's shoes, even if they are ruby red pumps. Thank you and good night. <laughs>